welcome to Let's Read. Today's Let's Read is going to be Imperialism and Socialism by James Connolly. As socialists, and therefore anxious to at all times throw the full weight of whatever influence we possess upon the side of the forces making most directly for socialism, we have often been somewhat disturbed in our mind by observing in the writings and speeches of some of our foreign comrades a tendency to discriminate in favour of Great Britain in all the international complications in which that country may be involved over questions of territorial annexation, spheres of influence, etc., in barbarous or semi-civilized portions of the globe. We are, we repeat, disturbed in our mind upon the subjects, because we ourselves do not at all sympathize with this pro-British policy, but, on the contrary, would welcome the humiliation of the British arms in any one of the conflicts in which it is at present engaged, or with which it has been lately menaced. This we freely avow, but the question then arises, is this hostility to the British Empire due to the fact of our national and racial subjection by that power, and does it exist in spite of our socialism, or is it consistent with the doctrines we hold as adherents of the Marxist propaganda and believers in the Marxist economics? This is the question we propose briefly to discuss in our article this week. We are led to the discussion of this topic by observing that the English socialists are apparently divided over the question of the war on the Transvaal. One section of the Social Democratic Federation going strongly for the Boers and against the war, another also declaring against the war but equally denouncing the Boers, and finally one socialist leader, Mr Blatchford, editor of the Clarion and author of Merry England, coming out bluntly for the war and toasting the health of the Queen and the success of the British arms. On the other hand, all the journals of the party on the continent of Europe and in America, as far as we are aware, come out in this instance wholeheartedly on the side of the Transvaal and against what the organ of our Austrian comrades fittingly terms England's act of bloodthirsty piracy. We ask then, is there no common ground upon which socialists can agree to treat all matters of international politics? A common standpoint from which all questions of race or nationality shall be carefully excluded, and every question dealt with from the position of its effect upon the industrial development required to bring the socialist movement to a head. Nominally, all socialists hold to the international solidarity of labour and the identity of the interests of the workers the world over. And during the Franco-German and Spanish-American wars, the socialists of those countries demonstrated that the belief was no mere abstract theory, but a living, concrete fact. But our English friend, Mr. Blatchford, deliberately throws the doctrine to the winds and declares that when England is at war he is English and regards all those who have taken up arms against England as enemies to be fought and beaten. This is unqualifiedly chauvinist and is a brutal endorsement of every act of brigandage and murder in which the capitalists of England may involve their country, it throws a curious sidelight on the mental makeup of this man, who very nearly shed tears of pity over the wrongs and Christ-like appearance of the anarchists expelled from the International Socialist Congress in London. Our esteemed comrade H. M. Hindman of the Social Democratic Federation, also in an article contributed to the Berlin Vorwärts and reprinted in Justice, took the position that England ought not to have given way to Russia at Port Arthur, but ought to have fought her and asserted English supremacy in the Far East. His reason for so contending being the greater freedom enjoyed under British than under Russian rule. Mr. Blatchford's chauvinist pronouncement can be ignored as simply a personal predilection and therefore binding no one, but the opinions of our comrades in the Social Democratic Federation of England hardly stand upon the same footing, but require severer consideration. That we may not be accused of criticising the attitude of others without stating our own, we hereby place on record our position on all questions of international policy. Scientific revolutionary socialism teaches us that socialism can only be realised when capitalism has reached its zenith of development, 
that consequently the advance of nations industrially undeveloped into the capitalistic stage of industry is a thing highly to be desired since such advance will breed a revolutionary proletariat in such countries and force forward here the political freedom necessary for the speedy success of the socialist movement and finally that as colonial expansion and the conquest of new markets are necessary for the prolongation of the life of capitalism the prevention of colonial expansion and the loss of markets to countries capitalistically developed, such as England, precipitates economic crises there, and so gives an impulse to revolutionary thought and helps to shorten the period required to develop backward countries and thus prepare the economic conditions needed for our triumph. That is our position. Arguing from such premises, we hold that as England is the most capitalistically developed country in Europe, every fresh conquest of territory by her armies, every sphere of influence acquired in the interests of her commercialists, is a span added to the life of capitalist society, and that every market lost, every sphere of influence captured by the non-capitalist enemies of England, shortens the life of capitalism by aiding the development of reactionary countries, and hurling back upon itself the socially conservative industrial population of England. Comrade Hindman claims that we should oppose Russia because her people are ruled despotically, and favour England because her people are politically free. But that is the reasoning of a political radical, not the dispassionate analysis of contemporary history we have a right to expect from an economist and a socialist of Hindman's reputation. Our comrade quite forgets to apply that materialist philosophy of history which he himself has done so much to popularise in its Marxian form, viz. that the economic systems of any given society is the basis of all else in that society, its political superstructure included. If he did so apply it, he would realise that the political freedom of England is born of her capitalism. Her capitalist class required a wage-slave class possessing such freedom or mobility of movement as would make them available at short notice wherever the exigencies of capitalism demanded. To gain such absolute freedom of migration, a political movement had to be inaugurated, placing the capitalist class in a position to break the bonds of serfdom for the labourer. This, once achieved, the capitalistic concentration of the workers in great centres of population gave to the proletariat the sense of numbers and opportunities of organisation required to complete the work of political enfranchisement. Thus, the economic necessities of capitalism, always and everywhere, beget a measure of political freedom for its slaves. Russia is not yet a capitalist country, therefore her people bow beneath the yoke of an autocrat. This is only saying that her capitalist class is not strong enough yet to force upon the government laws establishing the conditions most helpful to capitalist development. But every forward move of Russia in the direction of colonial expansion strengthens that capitalist clash in Russia, and in so doing breeds there the revolutionary working class. On the other hand, if the wishes of Conrad Hinman were to be realised, Russian capitalism would be checked in its growth, and the discontent in that country, lacking capitalistic conditions, would resolve itself into a purely agrarian movement the revolutionary proletariat would remain unborn. Drive the Russian out of Poland, by all means. Prevent his extension towards Europe, certainly. But favour his extension and his acquisition of new markets in Asia at the expense of England if need be, if you would see capitalism hurry onward to its death. It may be urged that our Irish nationality plays a large part in forming this conception of international politics here set forth. We do not plead guilty, but even if it were so, the objection would be puerile. As socialists we base our political policy on the class struggle of the workers, because we know that the self-interest of the workers lies our way. That the self-interest may sometimes be base does not affect the correctness of our position. In like manner, the mere fact that the inherited, and often unreasoning, anti-British sentiment of a chauvinist Irish patriot impels him to the same conclusion as we arrived at as the result of our economic studies, does not cause us to shrink from proclaiming our position. 
but rather leads us to rejoice that our propaganda is thus made all the easier by this none too common identity of aim established as a consequence of what we esteem the strong and irreconcilable hostility between English imperialism and socialism. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that, please make sure to leave a like, and if you want to hear more, be sure to subscribe. Thank you.